Okay, man. We're live. Tonight is the last night of the four-part series, man. And I appreciate everybody for tuning in every single week, whether it be live or whether it be taped. My name is Brother Warren, representing Peace, which stands for Please Educate All Children Equally. Tonight we have the awesome and amazing two brothers, two of my frat brothers of the Omega Sapphire Fraternity Incorporated, you know, looking at Black History Month and the fact that its origins are directly connected to the Omega Sapphire Fraternity Incorporated. And we'll talk about that. We've talked about that. And we'll talk about it again before the night closes out. Anyway, um, as we say within our fraternity, I'm going to let each of you spit your tag, whatever you want to say about yourself. Wish you name yourselves and tell the community out there who you are. You go with the uh, go with the young fellow. Go ahead, brother first. David. Okay, you go with the... Are you going to be first? Okay, go uh, I'll, first. I'll go. Uh, Dr. Drew Brown. Um, my home the chapter is Gamma Mu Nu in Middletown, Delaware, and currently I'm at the University of Florida as an assistant professor in African American Studies. Um, my area of focus is is the intersections of Black culture and sports, um, where I look at the agency and celebrate the cultural expression of Black people. Nice. Thank you, Dr. Drew. Appreciate you, brother. All right. I'm uh, David Rosario, Brother Rose. Uh, pledged Omega Psi Phi at the Omega Delta chapter at Westchester University in the fall of 1987. Trey Tail. <laughs> um, currently, I serve as a, a senior executive uh, assistant principal of operations at uh, Harambe Institute of Science and Technology Charter School. We are African-centered school with uh, 525 beautiful black and brown babies up in there. And we uh, govern ourselves in the Nguzu Saba and the Nguzu Ma'at and uh, the West African tradition. And we uh, incorporate that into our lesson planning. We incorporate that into how we raise our children up. And um, we're, we're moving the needle. We, have, we are currently, um, put a little tag out there, we're currently the number one um, school in our demographic in the PSSA ratings as we move that needle and we are working that formula. So I'm happy to be here. And um, I've been a student of history for the last, oh gosh, 36 years now. And so that's been my passion as Brother Warren knows, we've chopped it up on a number of occasions. So I'm happy to be here and to contribute. Yes, 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 yes. and paying homage to all the ancestors that have come through and helped to establish that organization. Um, have to um, shout out, you know, Brother John Skeef, you know, Beta Gamma Chapter 1965, and also, you know, Baba Joe uh, Foster, who just uh, made his transition into a mega chapter last week, and his service will be held this coming Thursday, and I'm looking forward to being there and, uh, you know, celebrating their brother's life and whatnot, man. So um, tonight, man, tonight, we're talking about from Black Power to Black Lives Matter, right? And this is the era in which we lived in. So we talked about a lot of different things thus far, you know, throughout our entire history, you know, throughout the world. And now we're getting down to this last segment. But, you know, all segments are important, right? But this is the segment that we grew up in, that we lived in from Black Power, you know, to current now today, uh, to Black Lives Matter. So um, I'm going to start the question. I'm gonna start off with this, first and foremost. <clears throat> Talk about the first time that you encountered racism. Um, hmm. What happened? You know, how did it make you feel? Did anyone have to explain what was going on to you? Um, and I have my answer too as well, but I want to hear y'all's first. Oh, that's a great question. I, I, um, I'll start. Off. I think I know the answer to this. Um, I was born to teenage parents. Um, that didn't work out for them, but uh, my mother picked up the mantle and we kept it pushing. So I'm a North Philadelphia kid. Uh, at some point, my mother um, was accepted into uh, Rutgers Camden and moved us to to Camden, uh, ultimately East Camden, but we stayed with extended friends in Pensacola. And my second grade year was disjointed from leaving North Philadelphia Public School to going to Pensacola. And I had never been around white children, predominantly white children before at that time. And the response on me was that I was quiet because I was nervous and afraid. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was always a straight A student to that time that I was aware of, but because of my silence, because of my afraidness, if that's the word, being in Pensacola in that new environment, these folks thought that I was um, a deaf mute <laughs> and, and treated me as such. And I can't know, even picture that, but, but go ahead though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they treated me as such, man, they, you right. know, and 
unfortunately, as, educa as educators, we know what special education looked like in the 70s and uh, the 70s. Yeah. It didn't look very nice. Um, and so they were putting, trying to place me into very nice, very unnice places. And my mm. mom, being around 21, young mom at that time, mm -hmm. does, does what young moms do. She went OFF. <laughs> And of course, got me out of that school, and you know, we got it together after that. But right. that was the first time. And to your point, brother one, I didn't really realize it because I was young. But my mother realized it mm -hmm. and, and schooled me on it, and not to allow myself to be marginalized, so forth and so on. Okay, okay, all right, Doctor Doctor Brown. Yeah, so for me, it's a little bit, um, I guess, a little bit different because I grew up in Canada, and so a little mm -hmm. bit about my background. Um, my some of my ancestors escaped uh, slavery from Kentucky, went over kind of like the stories are told, crossed the Detroit River uh, when it was frozen and landed in a place called Buxton, right? And if you if you heard of Buxton, Uncle Tom's Cabin, I believe has a reference okay. to Buxton okay. in there. Um, but it was an escaped slave community that established in Buxton, and we kind of uh, developed from there. And so the racism that I felt, you know, I, I grew up on a border city of Windsor, Ontario, right across from Detroit, Michigan. And I definitely, you know, had racism at a very young age. Now, my mother instilled in me that I was black. <laughs> she made it known from day one that I'm black. And I have to, you know, look out for that because people are going to treat me in a particular way just because of that. And so, um, and so I did. And so I, I, I noticed the way people had been treating me, although it's not as overt, I think, in Canada as it was in the States, uh, I certainly did get, you know, different treatment. But it wasn't, uh, I, I, I think it was when I was um, uh, on a way at a trip. It was like a, a, a camping trip for underprivileged um, people and kids and whatnot. And it was put on by Tim Hortons uh, back in the day. And I was about 10 years old. And we went on the trip, me and my brother, he was 12, two years older. And we got out there and, you know, the counselors are having us go and, and and bring them to our different groups and all of a sudden the fight broke out and i go over to check out the fight and i see it's my brother fighting <laughs> and i said man what are you doing he said oh this mother effer called me nigger i said oh we'll beat his ass then <laughs> and that was that and that was the first time i, I ever really experienced just so 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 uh overt forms of racism was at that time so um you know I, like i said my mom she raised me to understand and I'm black and have this identity. And so I always had been walking in that and knew that. And so when I heard that, um, I knew exactly what it was and what it was about um, and, and acted accordingly. Okay. Okay. Brother Ish, brother Ish, just saw you a moment ago on the other, on the other call. I'm glad you make it off here, brother. I appreciate you, man, as always. And so, uh, you know, tell, tell the people of the world out there watching, you know, this being our last night of this particular series, uh, who you are and what you do, what you want them to know. Yeah, definitely. Uh, my name is Ishmael Jimenez. I am uh, the director of social studies for the school district of Philadelphia. I also have a side hustle at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, teaching teachers how to teach. Uh, but besides that, I'm just glad to be here and uh, participate in this conversation. Appreciate you, brother. And so tonight, this first, we opened up a little bit of conversation, the question, um, the first time that you experienced racism, right, as a child and what was that about? Did anybody, you know, had to explain things to you? You know, just you know, go for that. Um, well, my parents uh, moved me uh, pretty young to uh, the suburbs outside of Philadelphia. I think around six, six or seven. Um, and from my first experience uh, attending a majority white school in the North Penn School District, yeah, I'm naming mm. it. Um, I remember uh, students, you know, and I am dark, y'all, uh, calling me the N-word. Mm. Uh, but my mother, who was like the only black girl who grew up on her block in Liverpool, uh, definitely spoke to me about race from a young age. So, like, I was already processing what that meant, uh, meant but it culminated in fourth grade with like a major racist incident with a teacher uh, when I rose my hand to try to answer a question, and I started stuttering and the class laughed and the teacher's like, oh, don't mind him. His people talk like that. Mm. Um, and I did not know exactly what that meant. You know, my mother being black, my father being Dominican and Puerto Rican. 
Um, even though I say Jimenez, that's because I didn't even know it was Jimenez until I got older. So I, d- I was unable to contextualize at that exact moment exactly what that meant. Uh, but the librarian heard about it and gave me her original 1965 copy of the autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, and all those experiences up until that point, it felt like I was battling, but not understanding what I was battling, right? But after I read that in fourth grade and fifth grade or whatever, I started understanding and even peeping, uh, even like those underhanded racist comments like, oh, I remember students, oh, chapstick needs a spray for your lips. Like little things, people Mm. who would call me friend, you know what I mean? And from that young age forward, I was able to discern like, oh, these these folks ain't about that. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it, but like, so for me, it was always just constantly present. Um, and then after my own kind of culminating experience in fourth grade, it became kind of like I was able to point it out even when uh, my my other black friends weren't able to make sense out of the experiences that they were having. Wow. Wow. I just got to share my story, man, since we're all sharing and whatnot. So the first time that I experienced overt racism, you know, because it was always systemic. Right. But the overt racism, directly thing that I experienced, I was about eight years old and I never forget my my mother. May she rest in peace. And I didn't live with her. I was raised by my grandmother. But I went to go visit her and she was fortunate enough to live in one of those new houses out in um, Penrose Park area. So Southwest Philadelphia had your, your upper part, your middle part and then the part where I lived at. Right. And so but out there, it was like sort of like, you know, the black folks and other folks with some money gets begin to gentrify that area that was underdeveloped and whatnot. I went to go visit them and um, went to go to the store to get a loaf of bread. And it's like, oh, get this loaf of bread. Um, I'm, and I'm, you know, a little chubby kid, whatnot. I'm happy you got my loaf of bread. And and I was into Bruce Lee at the time. I wouldn't have my Bruce Lee button on. And these two older white guys came to me and took the loaf of bread and, and tore it apart and stomped on the bread, right? And then took my my Bruce Lee button. I love Bruce Lee. I still got a picture of Bruce Lee in, in his house still to this day and Jim Kelly and all of them. Um, took my Bruce Lee button and stepped on it and, and sent, smacked me in the head and called me a nigga, nigga, go home, nigga, run. And I was, t- I was, you know, I was traumatized. I go to my mom and them and, 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 and her husband at the time and whatnot. And they've been looking for these guys and whatnot. But, I, and I was like, why would they do that to me? I, you know, I'm just a kid, you know, going to get this bread. And it had me, it traumatized me. And then I began to learn how in Southwest Philadelphia, or at that time anyway, in the seventies, you know, there was a lot of the racial pockets and whatnot. And you couldn't go, and you had the gang pockets. Then you had the racial, the racial pockets. You couldn't go to this street, that section, and so on and so forth. So for years, it was almost like this, this thing of, you know, us against them type thing, right? You know, and I wasn't looking for it, but then it began where, okay, now if it came, I'm ready to fight and stuff. But the one thing I will say, one thing I will say, and I'm just going to fast forward a little bit and close this part out. And once I began to play football, right, and on the football team, you had the the ones that couldn't afford to go to West Catholic or Newman, they were still kind of stuck at Bartram High School. I'm going to call that out because that's why I went to school and played and ended up going back there and working and so on and so forth. And they couldn't leave because maybe their parents couldn't afford for them to go. So we all had to play together. And mind you, they had been race riots at the school and in the neighborhoods and all that kind of stuff. But by playing football together, it allowed me to then look at those guys on my team. We had a common goal. like like They're like my brothers on a team, I guess, or whatever. Right? So it, it taught me that it wasn't just all about that everybody wasn't bad, put it this way. I'll just say it like that to just sum that up. That I couldn't look at that for a period of time. I was like, yo, ever since that eight-year-old me, when it was done to me, it was like me against them, them against me. But when I played football, it began to open up my mind to different people and cultures and so on and so forth and whatnot. So but the eight-year-old thing, like what kid eight years old needs to go through something like that, as well as anything that we've gone through, right? So that's in the 70s and 80s and so on and so forth, depending on, you know, what your age is. So when you first got the knowledge of self, right, the knowledge of self, how did that make you feel? And how did you begin to exude, you know, Black pride? Anybody can take that question first. Yeah, let me, well, uh, <clears throat> you know, so I look back and now that I, you know, I'm going to, I'm an African-American studies practitioner, right? Africana studies practitioner. And I always look back on, you know, my teenage years and say, you know, I wasn't a real sort of, you know, black power this and black power that. I don't think I was. But um, I, I remember when my football coach from high school 
Uh, we had a conversation before I went away uh, on, on my football scholarship in Pennsylvania. And he said to me, the white coach, right, knew I was going to a predominantly white school. He says, now, don't go over there talking about all that black power stuff. And I look at his comments and I say, was I really that in it? Was I really, did I really exude that much about my black pride and all of that? And I, I, I think I did. I saw the movie um, Panther with Mario Van Peebles. Mm. And that movie right there made me, I was a fan of the Black Panther Party after that. It was like, this is my style right here. You know, I, I was a football player. Um, I, 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 like I said, my mom, she really instilled in me this Black identity. And I wasn't really going to sit back um, in the ways that the civil rights movement did. But when I saw that movie and I saw, you know, these brothers out here being more aggressive about their self-defense, I was like, that's my style right there. And it gave me so much pride and I took it and ran with it. I was I was going to embrace the power um, from when I was 16 years old and saw that movie for the first time. And that's nice. kind of what it came from. Nice, nice. Oh, you said you showed that movie, Brother Ish? Oh yeah, man. Panther. The students love that John. Like they would ask me, I would I would let's just say folks, folks love that movie. And it's consistent. And it's no coincidence that you can't really find that movie anywhere like that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, even when I found it to show to my students, because I was like, What's that movie called? What I watched when I was younger that I want to show my students. I had to go out my way and had uh, a friend of mine find it somewhere because the DVD itself was, was over three hundred dollars. Um, mm. and then you couldn't find it anywhere else. So it's on YouTube now, but before okay. it was very hard to find. Okay, okay. Who else wants to take that question? How did it make you feel when you got that 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 first that that taste that acknowledged itself and it be, began to exude that black pride? How did that how did that go for you? Either of you. Ish Rose, either one of y'all. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um <clears throat> for me it it um as I was listening to uh, Brother Brother Brown speak, it's like you get the, you gather these puzzle pieces along the way. Like we spoke of our first time going a racist experience, and you know you listen, sitting at the table when you listen to holiday talk by your family. You know those little pieces we start gathering, but it's never activated. It's just in there, and mm -hmm. you just know intrinsically this is what I'm supposed to do. This until you have that moment, until you have that moment, and that moment for me was uh, we had just broke football camp at Westchester. I was a football, on the football team at Westchester. And, it, you know, got my, my, uh, like my lanyard on, my flip-flops, you know, going to get a slurp because it's summertime. Right. Finally get into my dorm, so forth and so on. I had just finished from Superman to Man by Joel Augustus Rogers. My first African-centered book I ever read was J.A. Rogers, Superman to Man. And um, those pieces were still swimming, and I'm figuring this thing out. And these four white boys in this Nova rolled by and was like, nigga, go home. And about one in the morning at Westchester, a hot summer night, I'm in the parking lot of 7-Eleven. I said, make me. They turned the car around and came in the lot. And, you know, it was what it was. <laughs> uh, and you know where I was, you know, uh, brother, brother Damien, you know. You played a couple of sports. You played a couple of sports, man. So they picked the wrong one that night, I'm sure. Picked the wrong one. Played a couple seven of sports. Cop cars later. <laughs> seven cop cars later. Yeah. The owner of 7 Eleven comes out and he says, They said, take the handcuffs off that young man. It's not his fault that they can't fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, it was a dichotomy of before I would have maybe been now I was never timid, but I wouldn't want to say anything. Right. I would have been like, yeah, whatever, man, keep it, keep it pushing. But there was something in me after reading that book, after experiencing that and being in this environment and probably the testosterone of being in shape after football camp, three weeks of football camp, you know, it's like, no, I'm not putting up with this no more. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Four against one, didn't matter if it was 40 against one. I think that culminating moment just popped out. Right. I wish it would have popped out a speech <laughs> versus a fight, but right. it popped right. out right. when it popped out. Right. So all those pieces and everything it just activated at that time. Right. Wow. There, 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 what's interesting about what, 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 I was gonna say what's, yeah. what's interesting yeah. about kind of like how you how you uh how you describe this and I think how you know a lot of us are are talking about these ideas of 
encountering racism and then getting into sort of a black pride, prideful identity. Mm -hmm. um, what we're basically ascribing in an academic sense is this is this model called negrescence. And negrescence was this model by William Cross, right? Really light skinned brother um, who came up with this. Um, why did I mention he's light skinned? I don't know, but it's it's interesting, right? I feel like <laughs> the light skinned brothers be the most powerful one. <laughs> <laughs> that's so wild we, my wife, we, talk, shows, bro. We, got, <laughs> we talk about that often man the, the light skin brothers yeah. like the most active out there doing right, know. it's all good though we need all of them we don't we don't right. All <laughs> right i mean malcolm gave us gave us the way malcolm gave right. us the way right, right, right um right. but he, he created this model called negrescence then the Gresson's model is the model of black identity development and what it does, it has stages. And so he outlines these stages, and there are some, you know, issues that that many people have with some of them. But all in all, in all, many people do agree that there are stages. The first stage, right, is um, is like this encounter stage where you first encounter um, racism, right? And it's this notion that we hadn't really been sorry. First is pre count pre encounter, but we're taught that we live in a meritocracy, but we're taught that um, we're all equal, all of this stuff. That's the first stage. The next stage is the encounter stage where we get exposed to racism and like, what happened? I thought y'all said that we're all equal. I thought you guys said that 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 um that this is a meritocracy and all of that. And now here I am being called the N word and, and being locked out of places. And so then we become uh, a little bit upset with that. We go one of two ways: we either immerse ourselves in our blackness, or we try to somewhat run from it. Mm. We try to try to get away from it and be like, oh, I'm not like those other blacks. Right. And then we start to sort of wrestle with this and become a little more balanced in the next stage. And the final stage is we utilize our positions and do what we can to try to do some uh, um, social activism and things like that. And so these are the different stages that we encounter. And so as people are going through and talking about, you know, the things of counter racism and how that impacted their black uh, black identity and engaging in black power, it just really reminded me of the different stages of negrescence. Right, right. Yeah, I, and uh, I'm glad you pointed that out because a lot of brothers that I knew that I grew up around did exactly that, what you just described. And unfortunately, some and I, another piece of that is to cling on to the idea of what blackness represents within this society, which is a whole nother layer when it comes to how people orient themselves towards each other and what it means to be black, right? Um, and some people accept what I call like a cartoon character uh, perception of blackness, um, especially the folks, some of the brothers I knew uh, in, in, in North Penn, right, <clears throat> in Montgomery County, where they were like, this is what it means to be, right, and then behave in that type of manner, while some other brothers I know rejected it in another way where they're trying to assimilate and be like, oh, no, it's not like that. You know, I, this is my friend, you know. Um, and then I would always be like, yo, what's wrong with y'all? Uh, and to the point where, uh, you know, folks was calling me Ishmael X in fifth grade. So like, you know, how p people point to that moment that like they started to like, you know, become much more militant. Like, I, I think I had to tame down my militancy in fifth grade because I remember when I was even in sixth grade, I used to write like, you know, uh, Black Power on the Malcolm X, John, I used to write on. And this is sixth grade, y'all. Um, and I didn't know exactly the nuances. I just defaulted towards those positions, right? And yeah. especially supported by my mother and uh, all the stuff that I was reading at a young age, like being introduced to the Panthers and stuff like, you know, and this is the this the, uh, mid-90s, early 90s, you know, the African medallion with the 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 koofy john on and i was all about that life at like you know fifth sixth grade um and i guess it goes back to that light skin type of anger, <laughs> anger. <laughs> but i think it also speaks to kind of like what you just brought up i was confronted with it but then also uh provided the tools right to put my anger in a certain vehicle right um of course i had to learn over time not all not all white people are evil. And I think that was kind of also articulated here a little bit mm -hmm. while also at the same time, like King also realized, wait, there's a lot of them like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think that speaks to kind of the experience um, based on where you're at. And yeah. you know, unfortunately, a lot of people don't have 
someone or a situation that allows them to make sense out of what they know in their gut is wrong. Right, right, right. I guess for me, you know, growing up, you know, I'd always had somewhat of an exposure a little bit here and there, like 12 and so on and so forth, whether it be my father being a member of the nation, um, you know, and getting that whole experience when I have an opportunity to attend the Harambe Day Camp that was started by John Ski. And my father sent me there like two summers in a row. It was at a White Rock Baptist Church, I guess, or whatever, um, up on 52nd and near Chestnut, I guess, or whatever. Um, we would go, we would go there uh, for day camp, and I would get exposed to Nguzu Saba and the rules of my at like eleven or twelve years old. I didn't know what they was talking about, but I, I began to feel something good about it. But when it really, really hit, similarly to you, uh, brother Rose, being out there in that area, you know, Cheney's only seven miles from Westchester, and we're actually pledging. And I have to talk about this story. We're pledging, and you know, sometimes at night they would leave us places out there, and we had to find our <laughs> way back home. I'll just say it like that, right? So one, so one of those nights. They left us out there we had to find our way back home. And we saw this light, this bright light, right? So we saw going to the light. It was like in this farm, this farmland thing. And it was literally folks out there burning a cross out there in Chester County, right? And so we saw that. We all ducking down like, yo, what's going on? We knew what that was, right? And so we're not supposed to go that way. So we like, you know, we had the, the camouflage on. They couldn't see us. It's nighttime. It's dark and whatnot. And we go back the other way. So then after that, that's 85. So then you're talking about what happens in 86 to 87? Boogie Down Productions, Public Enemy, they come out. I mean, the conscious rap music began to came out because the Cheney, awesome school, love my school, but it wasn't like there was an African-American curriculum there for us. Like, and the thing about it is the majority of places that offered those degrees at that time anyway were all the PWIs. You had to go to like, you know, you know Temple, UCLA, wherever you had to go to get that sort of degree, Right. At that time, but then have an opportunity to hear that music and then begin to buy these books, right? And then brother, you know, Stokely Carmichael, who we'll talk about in a second, you know, um, Kwame Ture, when he came to Chain University and him and Carrie Russell one came together, I was like, yo. And then me and brother Kabir, shout out to Kabir Hadass, he's not on here tonight, started an organization called UFS. I literally quit my job for a year and said, all I'm going to do is be on 52nd Street doing poetry, talking about black history, you know, making videos like back then, you know, seeing how many businesses in the community uh, weren't owned by us. Only businesses were owned, you know, by us were like, um, you know, barbershops, all the major money making businesses were not owned by us. So, but then I took that information. I said, you know what? I got to teach the babies. Right. And that's what prompted me to go back to school, get my master's in education and start going into schools. Because I knew in the schools, if I wasn't getting it, they weren't getting it. And my job was to go back in these schools and in between the curriculum, give them something that they could, um, you know, grow from. Shout out to brother um, Ryan Harris out there doing great work with his uh, foundation called As I Plant the Seed. He's the second grade young man once upon a time. Now he's, you know, 30 something years old, doing major work out there all over the country, you know, helping out the people and whatnot. He's doing his organization called As I Plant the Seed. So um, I'm going to show a couple of slides and keep it pushing. Yeah. Brother Warren. So Yes, sir. I was you, you said something that just took me so far back. I, 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 a quick aside, my my line brother had we you know trying to find our way back in a certain situation or two. Uh -huh, uh -huh. He thought it was a good idea to knock on his door for directions. <laughs> in Chester County. In Chester yeah. County. Oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, the, and the, the white gentleman with the shotgun. Yeah, 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 yeah. Knock on that yeah. door. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And oh I man, just, I, I was. Oh, sorry. I was, I was saying I was uh, first time I drove from Atlanta to go see uh, one of my uh, best friends. He the bros, my best friend played football in Jacksonville, and uh, um, he was playing in the NFL, playing in Jacksonville. So a couple of my my mentee, a couple of my boys, we jump in the car, driving from Atlanta to Jacksonville. We're talking, we're just grooving, whatever. And all of a sudden, I look down and the gas light is on. I was like, oh man, you know, understand? Atlanta, Jacksonville. So we see that there's um, there's one stop for gas right here, and the next stop for gas isn't for like another 15 miles, 20 miles. So we pull over, go down this side road. It takes us about half a mile down the road. It opens up a little bit, this gas station, nothing but Confederate flags all over the place. Three Ooh. brothers in the car, mm. a gas station full of Confederate flags. We say, you know what? We'll take our chance with the next 15 miles. <laughs> <laughs> That's real, man. That's real. And, and, you know, the thing about it is, you know, in Pennsylvania, 
Um, I can talk to many experiences like that in pencil tugging, man. I just, you know, we can talk all night just about this alone. But uh let's get to a little bit, little bit of content. But yeah, pencil tucky, man. Yeah, for sure. So let me uh share my screen here. Okay, so from Black Power to Black Lives Matter. And um again. In a fair use statement, all this information that I'm going to share here is for educational purposes only. So no profits being made off of this. It's just sharing information for the community and for the world at large. So why is learning Black history outside of school a must? Every week, we continue to say that we have these 12 states that are quote unquote mandated to do so. But as we know, um, in many cases, it's a, a checking of a box, you know, and a shout out to the teachers out there within these states, as well as anywhere else in the country that are actually doing the work, that are actually being revolutionary, what I would call using um, the practice of revolutionary pedagogy um, that was made, you know, coined by um, Dr. Mlefi K. Asante, right, in his book, Revolution, Revolutionary Pedagogy. They're still doing the work in spite of, you know, the states or the systems not sanctioning it or not making it a mandate thing. Shout out to Philadelphia for doing anything, for being one of the, were we the first, was Philadelphia the first to actually make it a graduation course? I know there's only one of yes. a couple, but the first, right? Yeah, yeah, we were the first. Yeah, yeah we we're definitely the first in that. And um, continue to keep doing what you're doing, man, to impact that work because it's definitely necessary out there, man. You know, so when we talk about, you know, programming, taking place outside of school. I was in Cincinnati this past weekend for an event, but had an opportunity to attend um, a STEM workshop, you know, through our organization. We do a lot of things for the youth. And this particular video clip, I was like, oh, I got to tape this real quick. Brother was talking about Dr. Carter G. So make sure that y'all can see this real fast. We're doing Negro History Weeks. But then a school in Ohio, Kent State, actually celebrated the first Black History Month. Did you know that Ohio had the first Black History Month? Celebrates whole month. And that's actually the house, and that's actually the men that celebrated. They call it Kumba Month. And then it was six years after that, that the president, President Gerald Ford, officially recognized February as Black History Month. 50 years later, after my beautiful fraternity started Negro History Week. So now you know our connection to Facebook. So I share that because, you know, the title of this entire, you know, series has been Beyond Black History Month, Why Learning Black History Outside of School is a Must, because again, whether it's, you know, through a fraternity, a church, you know, whatever it is, you know, organizations, parents in the community, community centers, whatnot. This was actually a program being held in a community center on a Saturday. You know, parents have to be creative to make sure you're exposing your children to this sort of content, this information, and so on and so forth. So I um, just wanted to share that clip right there, man. Yeah, Brother Warren, that's, the, that's representation as well as exposure. I mean, yes. those are the key. Exposure, 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 exposure. Because you don't know what's going to stick. And right. whatever direction these kids go in, it's in their toolbox. Absolutely. Absolutely. Does somebody have a question up there? They somebody have a question. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. It's Right, it's not. Pennsylvania is not represented. But so we got Philadelphia, man. You know what I mean? So, and, and I found that to be odd. As, as much as I know about Philadelphia, right? You know, being the first to start it, but then, you know, Philadelphia, it's like when you drive from, say, Philadelphia to, to, to cross the Penn State and places like that, you really get to see what Pennsylvania really is, right? You know, but I'm glad I grew up in Philadelphia. So, and worked in Philadelphia for all those years. So, I'm kind of spoiled, right, to the content, you know, to the fact that we have opportunities to teach the content. I mean, it's still a work in progress, right? But, you know, at least we had that opportunity in a space like that, man. So, fight the power, right? Fight the power. So we're going to talk about black power. You know, black power began as a revolutionary movement in the 1960s and 70s and emphasized racial pride, economic empowerment, and the creation of political and cultural institutions. The term black power has various origins as roots can be traced to author Richard Wright's nonfiction work, Black Power, published in 1954. And then also just jumping down, you know, during the Meredith March against fear in Mississippi, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, 
Chairman Stokely Carmichael rally marches by chanting, we want black power. So, um, you know, Kwame Ture, you know, also, you know, known as Stanford, you know, Churchill Carmichael, and he was born and he was a Trinidadian, grew up in the United States. And from age 11, he became an activist at 11 while attending the Bronx High School of Science, right? Now, here is a small clip of when basically Black Power. Well, I have a few minutes, only five, so if you'll allow me, maybe I can say some things that needs to be said in this country. That needs to be said in this country. And that's what I want to talk about. Now, I want to talk to black people across this country. I want to talk to black people across this country. There are four things we have to do. Number one, we have to stop being ashamed of being black. We've got to stop being ashamed of being black. Number two, we have to move into a position where we can define terms for what we want them to be, not what racist white society wants it to be. We have to move to define. We have to move to a position where we can feel strength and unity amongst each other from what to Harlem, where we won't ever be afraid. And the last thing we have to do is to build a power base so strong in this country that we'll bring them to their knees every time they mess with us. So I'm going to stop sharing that video right there. So when you see clips like that, or just you know, your own experiences with Brother uh, Kwame Ture, you know, Stokely Carmichael, um, how did that exposure of what he was saying resonate with you or anything that he may have done? And anybody could take that. <clears throat> when, I, when I think of Kwame Ture, I think of how the Caribbean influence you know, um, plays a major part into our movements. And I always wonder, is it the, you know, is it the 93 octane of uh, oppression versus the 89 octane oppression? Is there a difference in the oppressive state that makes some of the seemingly Caribbean brothers come here with less of a filter? Mm. You know, uh, or, you know, I'm just wondering because that, that gas is coming from a lot of the brothers in the Caribbean, not to underscore, you know, the brothers, of course, in the States and the sisters in the States, but it just seems like that, that those fire starters, that, that, that Marcus Garvey, you know, that, that Kwame Ture, those, those, those brothers from the Caribbean have a different kind of fire that comes with them, you know, when they bring it. So I was just, uh, that's one of the things that stuck with me as he, as he talks. Yeah, I mean, every time I hear that brother, man, um, I always think of, of him as he got older and he always uh, talk about the duty of the conscious is to make the unconscious conscious. Um, and I also think about the fact that just like W.B. Du Bois, right, um, that he left this country. He didn't think it was possible to achieve uh, black liberation here at that point, right? Uh, first, you know, through forcible exile, but then choosing to stay. Um, and even to the point when he died in 1998, uh, Kwame Ture swore it up and down that, you know, that that cancer was given to him uh, based on his politics. So, like, I think his honesty, his commitment to the people was unwavering. Um, and I think that is demonstrated right there in him trying to refocus the conversation and if you ever read his autobiography, that's what he always talks about when he talks about himself, um, about the need to refocus the conversation, to be intellectually honest uh, about what folks are facing, um, but also yet not be afraid of, of standing up against a monster. Um, and, uh, you know, the coverage in the Black Power Mixtape, which is a great documentary. If you've never, if folks never seen it, I strongly suggest it, uh, Black Power Mixtape. And this was real footage by Dutch film, uh, photom uh, filmmakers who actually recorded folks in the Black Power movement. But there's a great part with Stoke, uh, Stokely, when he was still Stokely, with his mother talking about, and his mother talking about how she's afraid of him. And he was going on about this is necessary. 
Um, so yeah, there's some there's some different type of gas in them Caribbean brothers. Um, but that is definitely uh Soakley represented that kind of like disillusionment that was described by Dr. Brown earlier of uh, being brought into this country and being told that this is the way forward and then looking around and seeing folks that look like him being pur purposely kind of held back within this society. And, uh, you know, Kwame Torre didn't stay, take that laying down. He stood up and fought probably towards even his own detriment. Yeah, I, I think that he had the same level of honesty and commitment um, to being sort of uh, um, truthful as Malcolm did, right? And we can draw connections between Marcus Garvey and Malcolm and, 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 and Kwame Torre, right? When you look at these brothers and the way they talk, um, Kwame Torre, even in that video, and of course he goes over to uh, University of, of California, Berkeley, UC Berkeley, and gives a talk there that is similar where he's talking in the in the in the free speech movement again, the movement against sort of the war in Vietnam and all of that, where he's not even talking just to black folks, but talking about how black power is not going to be used the way that white people want to define it, that black people are going to get to define their terms that they use. It don't matter what white people say black power is, it only matters what black people say it is because they're the ones that are using it. And black power is this is, is defined as this unity and this economic unity that that an economic power that can ha that can be had if black folks unite and worry about things in their own communities and not try to um, receive and accept uh, the type of understanding and the type of things that white society is telling them about themselves and about other people. Well, this is exactly what Malcolm was talking about. Malcolm was speaking to the pathology of black folks. Right. This the, the way in which black folks have been socialized to think about themselves and to praise these white folks and what they have and establish they have. So Carmichael's like, no, no, we're not praising that. We got gold over here. We got greatness over here. If we can get our stuff together, we have so much power that it don't matter what any other group people does or says. We are going to be able to be to do our thing and to have what we want to have as long as we can get together on one accord. Um, this is not necessarily what King was was saying uh, publicly. This is not what the civil rights movement was necessarily saying. The civil rights movement had an entirely different agenda than this, right? And this is part of the reason why Stokely Carmichael goes from the student non-violent coordinating committee um, to being the violent student. Sorry, the not sorry the not non-violent student non-violent coordinated committee, right? Um, <laughs> that after a while, they, they, they weren't necessarily not, not they weren't necessarily non-violent, right? They were more self-defense. And this is kind of where uh, Snook and Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement have their divide. Um, but the, when I when I hear Stokely, I really hear someone who has a strong level of pride, a strong level of belief in the power of black unity. And that's something that should be honored. Yeah. Yeah, watching uh, Eyes on a Prize, you know, seeing, like I have all the DVDs downstairs, watching Eyes on a Prize, I have the VHS still in tub somewhere, but I also got the DVDs now too as well. You probably could get it online or on stream somewhere, I guess, or whatever, but watching all of those. And then, like I said, you know, when him him and Kara's, one of the albums, I have several albums on, on my wall in my basement, and one of them is Edutainment, right? And Edutainment by Kara's One. And that album like helped to change my life, right? Like literally there's different, there's so much science in that album and there's different elements of, you know, Kwame Ture throughout that album. When they came to Chain University and they both spoke together, it was just, it was just amazing or whatnot. So definitely, you know, rest in power for that brother right there and all the things that he's done, you know, it's about our history, man, during the um, evolution in the beginning of, you know, black power. So can't talk about black power without going to the next group of individuals. And I believe, you know, brother Dr. Dr. Brown may have talked about him a little bit while ago, you know, the Black Panthers. Now, you know, rather than, you know, sharing this link, I'm going to go and go to the next page. Here's, you know, Brother Huey P, Brother Bobby Seal, you know, who was a professor at Temple University for a while. Um, I don't know how long, I don't know if he's still with us or not. I haven't looked that part up. He, I believe he still is just an elder, right? Um, but he was in here, you know, he had, his, I bought his barbecue sauce years ago too, also as well, to support the brother and whatnot. He had his business, you know what I mean? But, um, let me share this next piece right here. So their origin, right? The Black Panthers, you know, they found the Panthers in the wake of the assassination of Black nationalist Malcolm X, 
And after the police in San Francisco shot and killed an unarmed black teen named Matthew Johnson, right? So a lot of information out there. And you talked about the movie earlier called Panther. Um, the thing of it is a lot of people, when they think of the thing, the Black Panther and the way they look, they thought that they, you know, hated white folk. To the contrary, to the contrary. So this is a small clip of Bobby Seals speaking to that. When we went to the Capitol, we were there to deliver a message based upon our understanding of what racism is and how it's inflicted upon us in our communities here in America and deliver this message to the world that we must arm ourselves, that we are in imminent danger, that the concentration camps in Tule Lake in Arizona and Oklahoma are now being rejuvenated, reset up for us, and we will defend ourselves. The examiner made a report back here in the last Sunday's paper that we were anti-white, that we hold no bones, this is a quote, hold no, pick no bones about being anti-white. We, this is a bold-faced lie. We don't hate nobody because of their color. We hate oppression. We hate murder of black people in our communities. We hate the gross unemployment that exists in our communities. We hate black men being taken off into the military service to be fighting for our greatest decade in American prominence as freedom. In the Civil War, 186,000 black men fought in the military service, and we were promised freedom, and we didn't get it. In World War II, 350,000 black men fought, and we were promised freedom, and we didn't get it. In World War II, 850,000 black men fought, and we were promised freedom, and we didn't get it. In the Korean conflict, the so-called police action, a war, we fought there, and we didn't get it. Now, here we go with the damn Vietnam War, and we still ain't getting nothing but racist police brutality, etc. We are against oppression. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen for right now. Um, BPP, Black Panther Party. You know, so when you first learned about them and all the great things, now mind you, they have a very, a various amounts of history, right? But they did a lot of great things um, in, the, in their forming, their foundation of the organization or whatnot. Um, what did that do for you when you heard some of the great things? They did a lot of great things that you heard early on that they were doing when they first um, came to fruition? The, the Panthers for me, uh, being being the man of a certain age now, having coming in on the tail end of that, um, the the idea that here's our, our, our um, wave of young men who have, and women who have come through this educational system now, now they're spit, spitting some facts as it pertains to the facts that they've been taught in these universities and flipping the script. You know, they're coming back and when they talked about in California with the guns. Now I'm, I'm spitting chapter and verse of your laws, your, your amendments, your so forth and so on. Now they're coming without the connection to, uh, I won't call it dogma, but the religious aspect. That's been set to the side because because the nation had done that with Malcolm and things of that nature. But now we're coming with straight organizational, you know, fervor. And we're coming with language that you speak. We're using your language, your books, and we're flipping the script on you with your, your concrete concepts. And we're appealing to uh, maybe, you know, I'll put maybe, maybe your humanity, <laughs> because maybe that's one of the weaknesses is that we appeal to, something that we have in abundance that maybe another group who oppresses maybe doesn't have the same amount. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a whole nother concept. But I think that they were coming from a more uh, granular place rooted in some places where you could research and say, well, that's true. Well, that's true. That's true. And um, I think one of the things that I wish they had that the nation did have was ritual, you know, it, to, 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 I've read, um, I, I wish I could recall where I read, but one of the things that is a, a guard against infiltration, if you will, is to have somebody go through something to get in. It can't be so easy just to get in. You know, you get to screen somebody a little bit harder, you know, learn something about somebody, just not throw them a jacket and say, welcome. And I think that made it easy for some folks to get into some of our organizations and of course, uh, harm us from the inside out. Yeah. Facts. Anybody else want to jump in there with, with that? Yeah, yeah. When it, when it comes to the Black Panther Party, my goodness, 
I think the Black Panther Party, uh, um, like was said, these were a group of educated individuals. Now, um, they're you know, depending on what's how you're going to classify education, uh, some of these brothers, like like you know, Huey Newton was was damn near writing PhDs and PhD level uh, thesis and things like that. They were required to read certain things off the reading list when they were in the Black Panther Party. They were reading Black Reconstruction. That's like a 700 page book, right? By Du Bois. They were reading Dying Colonialism by uh, by Fanon. They were reading C.L.R. James and Kwame Nkrumah and um, uh, um, um, all of these other things. Carter G. Woodson, of course. They were reading all of these books. They were reading uh, um, Dos Capital by Marx and them, right? Like they were reading all of these texts as they're trying to develop their philosophies and their outlook and their approach to dismantling these oppressive systems. They were for, they were against oppression. They were for getting with other folks that were um, oppressed, these other oppressed groups. They actually list and talk about how um, even the LGBTQ folks and their organizations, they should get with because they too have seen a, a certain level of oppression and they need to not distance themselves, but come together in order to fight these, these, um, these oppressive systems, right? Like this is the Black Panther Party we're talking about doing these things. And so when we, when we talk about them, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that um, it wasn't just that they are against white people, they're against oppression. And if white folks or white supremacy is at the root or at the head of this thing, then that's what they're fighting. Um, one of the things that uh, that that becomes, you know, uh, one of the things that becomes sort of the, their their biggest challenge is this idea of COINTELPRO, which I'm sure you'll get into. Um, but I think that looking at uh, this idea of of being anti-white, I think is important to acknowledge about the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party was not anti-white. They, in Stokely Carmichael's book, um, Revolutionary Suicide, what he says is a lot of people felt like the Black Panther Party had a death wish. Like they wanted to go out there and they wanted to be killed by the police. That they wanted to seek death in their sort of martyred uh, positions. And he was like, nah, it's not that we wanted to commit and see our suicide. We don't want to die. We just can't see living without hum without our humanity. We can't see living without our freedom. We can't see living without liberation. And that's why they fight so hard for it. And I think that's a, uh, an amazing sort of position to take, this sort of revolutionary act of putting everything out there and fighting for the liberation and freedom of your people, not because you want to die, but because you just can't imagine life without it. Yeah, man. And, and, and I think it's so deep too. you know, how young they were, you know, Bobby Seale obviously was like 26 when they started, but Huey Newton was 22 when he basically almost solely authored the 10 point program. Um, and I think that when we're talking about that youthful energy, that's also a year after Malcolm was assassinated. Uh, right. They've always considered them themselves children of Malcolm, an extension of Malcolm's legacy. Right. Um, at the same time, they were also targets of the largest empire ever on themselves in a short amount of time. By 1968, and this is two years after they were founded, uh, J. Edgar Hoover said they were the greatest threat to American domestic security. Right there. Uh, nations, yeah, internal security because of their free breakfast program. And Huey even made it very clear, like, these are survival programs. These are meant to give us enough balance and enough groundwork and foundation in order to actually develop the constructs necessary for revolution. Um, but like a lot of folks leave out the fact that they also started up free medical clinics, free ambulance services, free, you know what I mean? Free clothes programs. Like they, folks were had an analysis that was much deeper, but then they were also infiltrated much more harsher and and also kind of dismantled from the, the inside out per se. Even when it came to the isolation of leaders like Huey, like there, Huey and Bobby Seale after 1968 weren't outside of prison at the same time until the mid seventies. Right. And I think that like folks like lose sight of the fact that the Black Panthers were not only targeted, but they were 
like explicitly pulled out and said, we're going to dismantle you and destroy you. And they went about doing that. And I, I view very successful, but it also speaks to the Panthers legacy. The fact of how much it still inspires youth today. We referenced the Panther movie when anytime Huey and Bobby outside that, that movie theater in the movie, pull out the gun and the police came up and they stand up against them. I don't care where you at. You have a full a classroom full of black children. You're going to get claps after that scene, and and then like senses of like strength, and that's really what the Black Panther Party uh, represented. Um, but we are naive not to learn the lessons um, that they they had to go through in the sense of misinformation. Because if you read the five uh, points or the five. Uh, tactics of COINTELPRO, it was not just discredit black black movements to white liberals. It was also discredit black movements to middle class black people. Um, it was also assassination. And we can point out Fred Hampton as one of the yeah. most glaring examples, but there's many other Panthers that were uh, literally just let out of jail, if not just died in prison to this day. Um, so when we talk about the Panthers, I think you're, we're, we witnessed that was represented the culmination of struggle. And then uh, a lot of folks in this country in power turned around like, that's not going to happen again. Um, and uh, definitely one of the other points of the COINTEL program was to delegitimize uh, de this type of movement for future generations. Yeah. And I think we have to ask, the, and I think we have to, we, we do have to ask critical questions and, 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 and have a critical conversation, um, just generally speaking, not here, but in general speaking, on the success of the Black Power movement, right? What things came out of it? Because COINTELPRO was extremely effective. Where yep. Black Panthers are still in jail now, when we think of folks like Mumi Abu-Jamal, right? And when we look at these, these folks, we have to ask ourselves, was that, was was that the optimal sort of move, right? Was that the move, um, I think, that, yes, brought us pride? Yes, instilled a level of, of, of Black pride among so many people, right? But was it effective in the ways we needed it to be effective? Right? What, what was the change that came because of that? And, I, and I'm not asking the question to, by saying that I don't have answers. I do have answers of where change came, right? But I, I also think that when we're looking at things now, um, I also see the way the civil rights movement worked in tandem with the black power movement, right? And I think that some of these some of these gains that were had wasn't just the civil rights movement, but it also wasn't just the black power movement either, right? And so um, I think it's important to, to to note those things and to identify that those are some of the more critical conversations that need to be had, especially as we're trying to identify ways moving forward that we should operate, right? Very um, good, Dr. Very good. Very good. And, we, and we mentioned we mentioned yeah. Black Panther Party. That's one of my favorite scene outside the movie theater when uh when Huey Newton comes out there with a the shotgun and the police officer says, uh, uh um um what do you do with those guns? And he says, uh, why well, have a constitutional right to, to bear arms, officer? And he says, Are those guns loaded, boy? And he said they weren't, <laughs> but now they are. They pig. He said, Don't you call me pig? <laughs> he said, But don't you call me boy? Oh man, oh, that was it. I'm telling you, man, that's, that John runs eternal, bro. I, I have students to this day that reference that John about 10 years later. Yeah. Dr. Brown, I wanted to add, add um, something from the from the uh, K to 12 educational world. One of the things we do um, uh, is when we find a, a blue ribbon school, if you will, anywhere USA, oftentimes they run a case study. And they want to know, how did you get to be a blue ribbon school? Where are you doing? you know, uh, professional learning communities? What is your professional development value? You know, what is your assessment value? What are, what are you doing in your curriculum? They just kind of pull it apart. And I think that minds like people in this group and other minds like-minded, we need to go in and maybe do a, a case study of our of our movements and, and let hmm. the data drive us. Let the data drive us. Let's, let's put our hearts in the driving of the data. And, and if it's a shortcoming, it's it's a shortcoming, but if we're talking about how do we move forward, we got to dive in and, and, and own errors, own good things, you know, and just look at it and say, how do we move? I think that the, 
the Black Panther Party is an excellent topic to do a case study on. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think yeah. that there's such a huge impact. I think there's such a huge impact that, you know, I agree, you know, obviously as an academic, right, I'm, I'm all for, um, you know, scientific and, and uh, scientific research, you know, if we ask the right questions and we can ask uh, the right questions and add the right context and all of that. Um, but looking at sort of one of the impacts of the Black Power Movement, um, I mean, you can't help but associate the Black Power Movement with the start of hip hop, right? That hip hop, yes, was a creative expression, but the emceeing that comes out of the initial years of hip hop were on the heels of the Black Panther, sorry, the Black Power and the Black Arts movements, right? Being the artistic side of the Black Power movement. And so we can't, uh, it, looking at the impact of it, um, we certainly would count the, the rise of hip hop in uh, the impact of the Black Power movement. Right. So I, I definitely wouldn't say that there wasn't an impact, but I would say we just need to take this assessment and start to take inventory as to what that was, especially as we move forward and try to figure out what is the best mode um, and approach moving forward for, for our liberation and progress. Uh, just real quick, uh, Dr. Brown, I want to veg you back off of that, because in Philadelphia, we had the 1967 student walkout. Right. And then eventually a lot of them folks became embedded within educational structures uh, that produced the elective for black history in schools, uh, which culminated in 2005 with it becoming required for graduation. Yet at the same time, it also perpetuated myths of racial progress where folks kind of neglected paying attention to the fact that most folks who are teaching a subject aren't receiving the necessary training or edu you know, uh, academic background in order to teach such a subject, just if you're social studies certified. And so like, I just think about that, like uh, uh, the being the victim of your own success in some places like the first black mayors and you know, what happened at Gary in 72. Um, and it just makes me think of like, kind of like the backlash of Reagan you know, uh, the resurgence of hip hop consciousness, if not resurgence, but the pinnacle of it. And then the total, you know, destruction, quite frankly, purposefully, I would even argue, of that genre, of that type of mode of thinking when it came to popular music. The fact that we're talking about Panther, I would argue the last great black movie for real, for real, um, since 1995. And I know I might get in trouble for saying such things, but if you look at things compared to that movie, you get a lot of confusing narratives that aren't really necessarily based in black liberation, but more based through the white gaze. Sure, that ending in this quote unquote racial harmony. Yep. Right, but not yep. black liberation. Remember the Titans. <laughs> <laughs> Got that on my wall downstairs too as well, man. You know, hey man, I'm just letting y'all do your thing, man. Y'all driving all types of science up in here. And that's what this is all about right now, man. Um, yeah. Any final real, thoughts? Any more thoughts on black on the Black Panther Party? Well, real, 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 real quick, like just this idea of the Black Panther Party being, being a sort of revolutionary um, movement and moment, right? The Black Power movement. Um, it was Dr. Anthony Montero that that really developed me to understand that with every revolution is a counter revolution. Mm. And we see that with the response to Barack Obama, of course, right? This this perceived racial progress, right? That just it just Barack Obama is the symbol of, of of supposed symbol of progress, and we see the backlash on that, right? Because you know people I mean, right? are the wrong definition. Power, we keep saying black power, but the example holders if you will, have shown you that <laughs> power is to be take it and knowing how to wield it once you have it power is an absolute thing and we keep uh we we have this eternal dance with what we say power is it's like when naim akbar says what is freedom you know it's freedom when you get the manacles off your arm it's freedom when you want to live next to you i want to work where you work i want to be what you are i want to live with you i'm free i'm free i'm free and it keeps moving it keeps moving well power is absolute and and, and dr john henry clark talks about how knowing how to wield it once you have it not just us, you know, you gotta know how to wield it. And I think that whatever movements we ascend to, whatever conversations we have, whatever revolutions come along, there needs to be the element of understanding that there's gonna to have to be a notion of taking it and knowing how to wield it once you get it. 
And the Black Panther Party knew this because they read Marx, because they read Fanon, because they read these folks. In um, um, Paulo Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he says, um, he looks at the oppressed groups and he says, oppression, uh, the oppressed groups have to free themselves. They can't be given freedom because if someone can give you freedom, what can they also do? Take it away. And is that really freedom, right? But the Black Panther Party knew this. They knew this. This is why they fight the way that they do. They knew that they had to be the ones to liberate themselves and liberate, and, and, and Black folks had to be the ones to lead the charge. Now, yes, other people can, can help in doing, in, in doing certain things, right? Like Malcolm said to the college, Malcolm said initially to the college uh, white girl that you can do nothing to help us. And then later goes back and says, I wish I had her address. I'd write her a letter and tell her, you can go to those white communities and tell them to stop being racist. That's what you can do. Right, that there are people that can play a part, but black people have to be the ones to save themselves, or else is it really freedom if somebody else just gives it to you? Mm. Right? Do you really have power if someone else has the power to give and take you take your freedom? That's right. Right. That's right. And so that, and this is one of the things the Black Panther Party they knew. Right, and we also have to know that in that equation, that those that currently have power will destroy everything before they give it up. Mm -hmm. so we, and, have to, and, we have to take that in our thinking as well. And, and I think of uh, Amos Wilson, who the uh, his the ancestor's birthday was this uh, this past Friday, and he says, "Yet we have leadership that thinks our own the only crime has been the fact that we don't get a higher percentage of their thievery and robbery," mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which speaks to kind of like this confusion, this malaise, right? Like the Black Panthers were somewhat clear, like the, the even just framing it as a proletariat against, the, you know, the power and the oppressor, we don't even have folks that agree with that. If anything, we have, like Paulo Ferrari said, if you only get educated by the oppressor, your dream is to become the oppressor. Um, and we need to really reclaim a lot of this Ooh. heritage and a lot of this, like, like language our ancestors framed out. Because I was saying before, like after the Black Panthers, after the assass uh, assassination of Fred Hampton, them folks looked around like, yeah, that's not going to happen again. And I always point out my students like, who since then? We started talking about freaking Jesse Jackson or Jimi Hendrix. And, like you ever been to a Black History Museum? And after the, after the Black Panthers, it just comes to talk about Black culture in uh, the white gaze of uh, the Jeffersons. We're so like, you know, good times, you know, the TV shows, the hip hop artists, you know, and then it all caps off with Barack Obama. And uh, I get concerned that this narrative and you talk to our youth, they, they peep game. Um, they might not know the details of why it's wrong, but they're like, yeah, that's right. some nonsense. I ain't co-signing that. Yeah, I, I do want I do want to. Uh, I think it's all all great stuff. Right. It's a great conversation. I do want to make sure before we run out of time that I acknowledge some of the things that um, get get built beyond the Black Panther Party, that the Black Panther Party may have had some gaps or some blind spots in, right? When we talk about Black women, we have to understand that the reason why Angela Davis criticizes sort of her experiences um, in the Black Panther Party and whatnot is because there were some blind spots there. And I think it's important to understand that the Black Panther Party didn't have everything absolutely correct and right, right? That we just have to be, um, we, 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 we can't be, we can't romanticize uh, some of these things. And so I think it's, but, but I also think it's important for the Black Panther Party had to go through these things in order for folks to come behind them and sharpen our understanding of them, right? To be able to look at that and say, here's where they got it right, Here's where we have challenges and need more improvement. And I think folks like Angela Davis and other folks came behind the Black Panther Party and work. And I want to just be, uh, be able to acknowledge that. I also want to acknowledge the way that um, Asada Shakur came by. And 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 as, um, as, as Brother David said, right, that adding some of the or criticizing that there wasn't enough African identity and African rituals and African um, cultural identity embedded in the party as well. And I think some of that then comes behind in order to sharpen our uh, understanding of the ways in which we should be moving forward. Yes, push for Black pride. Yes, push for liberation and freedom. Yes, 
fight for these things, um, to take it, but also engage and, and, and make sure that our identity is based in African heritage. Yes, make sure that we're not being patriarchal while we're doing these things. Yes, make sure that we're um, including um, women in these in, 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 within the leadership and within the core of these things. I think these are all things where um, we look at the Black Panther Party and then sharpen ourselves coming behind them. And I just want to make sure I, we didn't miss that uh, in the conversation. Say, say what you just said, uh, put in the uh, chat, uh, Brother Ish. Oh no! I was just I was agreeing with the brother right okay, there. Okay, and okay, okay. Just like the devaluation that some folks in the Panthers even did towards what some folks, you know, call cultural nationalism, uh, black nationalism, even the idea of like po pork chop revolutionaries and all that. Mm. Um, which you know, I I am, and we're not naive enough to believe that the forces of government and oppression didn't use against people and against organizations to uh, to create and sow more division. And that's why it's very important for our youth to learn those lessons about how COINTELPRO was used, but even how COINTELPRO 2.0 works now, mm -hmm. um, because we would be under some foolish illusion to believe that the powers that be just stepped back and was like, oh, okay, we don't have to interfere into uh, black political uh, social thought. Um, and, you know, we can point out to other things of how that manifests itself today. Um, but that's a whole nother conversation. Man, listen, you know, if we can stay on this topic all night long, you know, I want to get to a couple other things and whatnot, you know, but this is, this is awesome and amazing. Those that are out there watching and, and taking notes and whatnot. And brother, is you doing me to share that file now or share it later on? Would you just drop it in, in the box? Whenever. Okay, I'll cool. Just, I got you for I'll sure. For sure. It. You got to check out that, John, for sure. All right, so let me go ahead and uh, share my screen real quick. Get to the next topic. So this is a lot of stuff. We're talking about a lot of different things in a short amount of time. So just dropping seeds, planting seeds and whatnot. So those that are out there listening, and just for the first time, and your children never heard this stuff because it's taking it back to the babies, it's because they don't learn these kinds of things in school, right? So now we're providing you parents and everyone out there an opportunity to get this information, have your kids come watch it, do your own research, and build up their toolkit on all these things. So we got the war on drugs, mass incarceration, and the new Jim Crow. Now, those are three separate things, but they're all inter interconnected, right? So we're going to go semi-quickly. So the war on drugs, you know, actually years ago, there was you know, uses for medicinal drugs back as early as the 1890s, right? And Sears and Roback, I found this out, actually had a catalog where they advertised a syringe and a small amount of cocaine for $1.50 because it hadn't been outlawed. You know, that's crazy to me, but, you know, let's keep it going. So talk about the evolution of that, right? Talking about alcohol, you know, smoking opium, things of that nature early on, Right. And we know with alcohol now, what's going on now with alcohol, it's, it's, it's legal, right? And nobody's really going to jail or anything for alcohol now the way they did many, many years ago, right? War on drugs begins. The marijuana tax, learned this. 1937, marijuana tax was passed. Federal law placed a tax on the sale of cannabis, hemp, and marijuana, right? And think about what's going on now with marijuana. You know, finally being able to get, you know, um, quote unquote legalized or taxed in certain places and whatnot, but not federally, because if it was, then everybody, if that, if that was your thing and you had a job, you wouldn't have to get tested for that and you would be okay. But we're not there yet anyway. Yet. The Controlled Substances Act. President Richard Nixon signed the Controlled Substances Act in 1970. This statute calls for the regulation of certain drugs and substances. Schedule one drugs are considered the most dangerous as they pose a very high risk of addiction with little evidence of medical benefits, marijuana, LSD, heroin, MDMA, ecstasy, and other drugs that are included in the list of Schedule 1 drugs. Please, and jump in anytime you want you know, about some of these things here I'm going over relatively quickly. And then the war on drugs. You know, Nixon went on to create the DEA in 73. This agency is a special police force committed to targeting illegal drug use and smuggling in the United States. Now, say no to drugs. In the 80s, President Ronald Reagan reinforced the expanded of many Nixon's war on drugs policies 
1984, his wife Nancy Reagan launched the Just Say No campaign, which was intended to highlight the dangers of drug use. In 1986, Congress passed the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, which established mandatory minimum prison sentences for certain drug offenses. I'll stop right there, because that right there, the mandatory minimums, is how they were actually being able to imprison many people of color, right? Because you had different drugs that were, um, you know, just to keep it real, crack versus powder cocaine, right? And because of those two different types of drugs, you know, there's many people that receive multiple years of sentences still to this day because of, you know, the crack cocaine versus the powder cocaine. In 2014, nearly half of the 186,000 people serving time in federal prisons in the United States have been incarcerated on drug-related charges, according to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And many of those people don't like everybody here on this panel, right? So, but when you talk about that, and, you know, there's different philosophies and theories out there, you know, allegedly, you know, people say that the government, you know, help support the Contras, you know, by using drug sales. I mean, the movie was called Snowfall. They just went off an awesome movie, awesome series and whatnot that was on for many, many for about six years, I guess, or whatever, um, and as well as other writings, things you can read. You know, here's a document here, actually, the National Security Archive, which talks about the Contras, cocaine, and COVID operations. Anybody, please read that. If you need me to, I can drop this inside the uh, boxes as well. For those that are here, Check out this article yourself. No, nah, and I just want to say that's some real stuff. And uh, if anybody hasn't seen the movie Kill the Messenger mm. about the reporter Gary Webb, who in the San Diego Mercury, I believe, exposed a lot of the CIA uh, coke connections in relation to the Contras. Um, and you even got to give it up to uh, Killer Mike, even though I don't really like his politics, especially right about now he's talking about nonsense. But in his song Reagan uh, from his first album, mm -hmm. he actually shows Reagan saying, we did not give money to Contras and then turn around and say, oh, despite what I believe not to be true, we did give money to Contras. And part of that funding was funded through uh, allowing uh, illegal drugs to come in here in order for them to purchase weapons in order to give them to Contras in Nicaragua. And uh, it's heavy, man. And, 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 it's still a reflection of disposability that this society feels uh, towards black people. And while at the same time feeling like the need to neutralize the perceived threat. I mean, when you talk about, so let's, let's, let's stay there for a second because, you know, yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and, 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 and stop sharing my screen. So when we think about things like that, <clears throat> as far as, you know, drugs being allowed to be sold and then all these different, you know, uh, liquor stores. You can go to some delis now, I guess in the hoods where they're giving out shots of liquor and stuff like that, right? And, um, you know, then you got the gun violence and whatnot. But, you know, we don't really own gun shops like that. Now, I believe in the right to do whatever you want to do in terms of guns or whatnot. You know, it's all right. We can do it. That That's that's our thing. I, I embrace that aspect of it. But for the young people out there, they're getting all these. Where are they getting all these things from now? I guess now you can make them now, too, with these 3D printers. That's a whole other conversation and whatnot. But, you know, all these things that are just dumped in our communities and whatnot, you know, to basically, I think it was a... um a picture that I saw years ago where you had like the KKK and, and they show where so they y'all doing the job for us essentially, right? They're doing the job for us. You don't have to them to come and do anything to us because they put all these things in these systems in place and things in place and whatnot. Yeah, but going back to the drugs again, so we can do ourselves in. And it's nothing is is beyond you know reproach. When you think about the Tuskegee experiment, you talk about there was a book called Medical Apartheid, you know, all those different kinds of things that were done. Right, you say something about this? <laughs> uh, I, I was just saying that that book, man, that kept me up, and I don't even like every time I think about that book, bro, I cringe. <laughs> right, it's bad. I think I got yeah. over there somewhere, but, but medical you know. apartheid, the, the 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 case of Henrietta Lacks. I mean, there, there, there's so many, right? I think that um, when we're when we're talking about these laws, when we're talking about these things that are done to Black people, especially when we're talking about drugs, right? I think that looking at the difference between the different sentencing between crack cocaine and powdered crack um, is a framing of drug that is associated with a particular group, right? That we frame crack cocaine as being associated with Black people, or, or it was, 
And that's why they were able to get away with that for so long of over sentencing people with crack cocaine. But I think that similarly, the way we talk about guns and when we associate a certain uh, type of gun use with black folks, it's looked at as being so bad and so barbaric. But if you're really thinking about it, this is the identity of America. And there are many people that have talked about this, that America in itself is relying on the gun. Just look at how much we spend on, on defense. My God, the reason why America is quote unquote, right, the, um, uh, the, 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 the greatest country in the world, right, um, or is, is, is the most dominant culture country in the world is because they will blow anybody who says otherwise to smithereens. That's really what it is, right? That they have the gun to be able to, to do that, right? And so, and, so, and so I think that when we talk about the way that um, in, 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 you know, South Side Chicago, if somebody kills somebody's cousin and then that person says, well, you killed my cousin, so I'm going to come now and kill you. And the news is going to look at that person as barbaric and uncivilized. Meanwhile, Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein supposedly hit America and what America do? We going to get them. We going to get them. And went and did. It's the same concept. But when it's Black folks in Southside Chicago, it's barbaric and, and inhumane and, and uncivilized. But when it's America doing it, it's being patriotic and, and, and having pride in your country. How does that not match? How is that not the same thing? Right. But it's just the way I mean, it's framed to be associated with Black folks with being negative. Go ahead. When, I when about, I look you know, at prop, propaganda lies and so on and so forth, when I saw what they should put, put, put in the box, I ain't going gonna, gonna to get into that right out here because you know what I mean? But, you know, 100%, 100%, brother. I'm right there with you on that one. Um, but yeah, but it's like, so, you know, when you control, when you, when you win the war, you control the narrative, you control the history, you control whatever's out there in terms of the media and so on and so forth and whatnot. And when you're in charge, you get to get to do that. Just for the chat, 100%. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, great. You going to say something, Brother Rose? I was going to say, you know, when I when I look at a thing, whatever a thing is, I I start at thirty thousand feet and I work all my all my work my way down to ten toes on the ground, and so when I look at this thing called America, I look at this thing as here's a people that you brought here uh, to be agricultural. Mm. You you move forward, you go into industrial, but before you get into industrial, you get into the trades because those agricultural people came with skills and trades, but then you brought uh, immigrated people up in here to take over the trades. Now you get into industrial. Then you get into technological. Then what do you do with this group of people that you have no further use for? That's my 30,000 foot view. We're the group that you had no further use for because you filled the spots in other places. So now you start kicking us around like the kickball. Now we're getting down into the 10 toes on the ground. Now it's the co tell pros. Now it's the drugs. Now it's the this. Now it's the 13th Amendment. Now we get mass incarcerate you. And now everybody's getting paid off of you. We pimping you out. We pimping you out. We pimping you out. And we keep your pathologies localized because of course there's going to be pathologies, you know, because we're doing this to you intentionally. We, 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 um, you have a Rockefeller education center that educational system that won't allow you to get but so far you know it's just so much you know that that we don't know our enemy the diabolical level of our like Doc, dr brown talked about you know how they look at it in the south side of chicago but we over here killing thousands uh, thousands at a clip and the, and the navy seals talk about it after they declassify oh yeah we knocked up about 250 a day so i'm just saying that yeah this is what they're doing to us. And, and, and we have to understand that this enemy or, or this opponent is supremely diabolical and skillful. And one of the things, they, one of the things when you said, what do you do with the people you have no more use for? Well, apparently you just go and lock them away. Because in 19, and this say this in, in, in the New Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander says this, that in 1980, there were 200,000 prisoners in the US, right? 200,000. 30 years later, by 2010, there were 2.4 million. That's over 10 times as many, right? People incarcerated. 
in a matter of 30 years, you grow the incarceration system by 10 times? I would Disproportionately love to being black and brown folks? Absolutely. And I would love to follow the dollar. You follow that dollar, even though with that prison industrial complex, a lot of people that don't look like us got super paid. Of course. I mean, I, I think y'all are describing America, though. What's what's more American than the idea of killing for what you want, right? And unfortunately, our babies, uh, too many of our babies have internalized that, right? Yeah. Uh, what What is more American than, you know, the disposability of black lives. I mean, this whole thing is built and 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 structured off of that premise uh, to the point where I would even argue, regardless of your racial identity or your ethnicity or whatever you call yourself, you can be pink with purple polka dots. If you can't admit that black people in America were never meant to be free, you hold anti-black views. And I would just, it's as dramatic as that because this society by default uh, makes it, the in, indoctrinated truth that something's wrong with you. Something's wrong with black people. That's the problem. Something's wrong. Oh, well, there's more, you know, the, the father's not in the home or something's wrong with their culture. And the, and the list goes on and on with what's wrong with black people, but we don't talk about the what's wrong with the structure that created the reality that we find ourselves in. And uh, I think that's a reflection of a lot of anti-blackness being embedded in the very uh, common sense nature of what it means to be an American, and, and, and this is and this is and this is why I think it's important to um, understand like systemic racism, right? Um, but but I, I also think so. I say this in my class. I never run out of time here. I say this in my class all the time, right? We go over systemic racism, right? We go over institutional racism, and I say, well, how much of of, of black people, generally speaking, of their successes and failures? When black people, when we say that black people are not are not successful as as much as other groups, how much of it is attributed to them as individuals, and how much of it is attributed to the systemic and institutional racism? They'll say something like a common one is seventy five percent the system. Okay, cool, seventy five percent the system. When black people fail, seventy five percent of their failure system, other twenty five percent is individual. Okay, we'll go with that. Well, if we're gonna say that, if we're gonna say that black people seventy five percent of them them failing at times is the system, then we must also say that 75% of the reason why white folks succeed is because of the system too. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a, in a capitalistic system, it's a give and take, right? It, there's a finite amount of, of, of resources and, and, mon and money and things like that. If someone gets rich, other people get poorer. If those people go back and get richer again, other people get poorer. Yeah. Right. It's a balanced system. Well, if black folks are being held down, other folks are being held up. And if the reason why black folks are being held down is because of the system, then the reason why other people are held up is because of the system. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, yeah, I can honestly say, you, you know, so many things come to, come to my mind. I can talk about my previous three years where I had an opportunity to serve as a as a principal of a juvenile justice facility here in the state. And in that space, I'm going to say 99, 95 to 99% and sometimes 100% of the students. I call them students, the scholars. They call them, you know, residents or inmates or whatever. Or black or brown, right? And many of them, and they were, and when they got a chance to sit down in those spaces and I actually educate them and have been to school sometimes for a couple of years, they were actually, many of them were very bright, right? And now they had no other distractions. They just had opportunity and they loved going to class and I would incentivize them and bring them different, you know, food from the outside because they got tired of eating institutional food. And that kind of gave me a segue into them because that was like their freedom, getting that cheese, they go that pizza on a, on a Friday, you know, doing the right thing in class. And it meant so much to them because some of them were going to, gra I graduated several and they went straight to adult lockup for like the next 25 years. Like, imagine that after being in school, turn 18 and now turn 18, it took me 25 years. Or I had some that would get out and then, you know, within a year, wind up in adult like up or, or dead in some cases, right? And they were all black and brown, young brothers and whatnot. And I had one young man tell me, one young man tell me, he said, Brother Warren, I'm supposed to be in here. I said, Brother, why you say that? Well, when I was a baby, you know, my mom had me while I was in prison. My father, he was in prison, right? Now, whatever they had gone through, and they were in the drug game, you know, so again, going back to, you know, and dad sold crack and all these different kinds of things when I, so they were caught up with that. And then they had, you know, it's like the hate, the hate produce in a different kind of way, right? The self-hate, 
the hate produce, right? In a different kind of way. Um, so so many well, things. Cornell, Cor- Cornell West calls that Cornell West calls that nihilism, the mm. nihilistic threat. When you have these cycles, right, where folks are being um, folks are being racially discriminated on because of racism, right? Um, they're not going to be they're 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 in neighborhoods, right? That are quote unquote uh, have poor education systems, right? Or undereducated people that are undereducated are underemployed. Mm-hmm. Folks that are underemployed that that need need money. Uh, will go to illegal means or non-legal means, which land them in jail, land them in jail. Now they go on job interviews and they can't get the jobs because they're ex-felons and things like that, which means they got to do more illegal things. And they become this cycle that you're caught in. And when people see this cycle, they say, ain't no point. I might as well just start selling drugs from jump because I ain't going to escape this thing. Right. And this is the nihilistic threat. This is also the thing the Black Panther Party fights against. The Black Panther Party is trying to instill pride that, yes, we can do these things. Yes, we can lift ourselves up. Yes, we can escape this oppression. And I think just kind of bringing it back to that, I think the nihilistic threat uh, is quite a, the number one threat uh, against Black progress. And this is the very thing the Black Panther Party was trying to avoid. And, and true power, true power can change all of that. Because yeah. I don't like it, I'm going to rewrite it. I'm removing it. And knowledge That's of self, right. love of self. Absolutely. Just like you had, a, 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 this this country had a um, the Articles of Confederation. Well, I don't like it. I think I'll have a Declaration of Independence. A new con- I'll have a new uh, Constitution. <laughs> you know, I don't like it. I'll change it. I don't like the way this, I'll amend it. Right. I'll amend the amendment. <laughs> That's the game. So... Man, all signs being dropped tonight, man. Like I said, yeah, so many different topics and whatnot and not enough time to get in there because I'm going to keep your brothers all night. I would love to keep you all night, but I know I can't, you know, and I'm going to get this in. So looking at the next thing, the new Jim Crow, you know, the book, I have the book and also as a workbook that goes along with that. And it speaks to, you know, this new caste like system, right? Being created because of the mass incarceration and whatnot. And I would always like between things like the 13th, you know, the, you know, the documentary and also, you know, concept. The, the Ava DuVernay talked about, you know, the new Jim Crow, things like that. I mean, these are just some resources that parents out there, in my humble opinion, you don't have to use these, but that I found to be very, very helpful in trying to educate our babies about what time it really is. You know, they're getting locked up. You know, another uh, resource, you know, kids for cash, you know, kids that are getting locked up, getting incarcerated and whatnot, and then going right to the system, like I just talked about. All these kinds of things, you know, the parents need to become more aware, you know, and then hopefully that trickles down to their, their child. Uh, I can just say real quick, you talked about neighborhoods. I took a young man home today, you know, because like I said, I do some still some work down here. And I took him to a place that was his home and it was a hotel, right? And and it looked like, you know, a scene from the wire, like, but even like the worse than the wire, right? So I'm like, this young man doesn't have a chance. Like, you know, I used to say this for years in my career. I wish I could take some of these guys, you know, to my own situation and not get them away from, you know, these circumstances. Because right now, you know, he's already behind academically, you know, mom is on this, dad is on that. And, and he has to go home to this every single day. And I see why now he is the way he is. And we can have that story over and over and over and over again and whatnot. Um, and then, you know, but the system is designed by design to create this, right? That new cast, like the gentleman like this, eventually, unless something really comes into their life to change their course, change their pattern, they're going to wind up in the system, man. You know, they're already in this. They already, they got, as, as Dr. Um, Joanna Kajupo said many years ago, with the fourth grade failure syndrome, by the time you're fourth grade, if you can't read, they got a number, they got a bed with you for you already. You know, and I, I fully believe that, you know, so. So Black Lives Matter. We're almost coming to the close. Black Lives Matter. You know, international social movement formed the United States around 2013, dedicated to fighting racism and anti-Black violence, especially in the form of police brutality. Um, essentially, you know, after the Trayvon Martin shooting um, is when it really began to. It's not great. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, my bad. I don't mean to cut you off, but uh, today is the anniversary of Trayvon Martin. Absolutely. 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 Sure. I learned that on the other call. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, rest in, rest in power to that young brother, man. Rest in power to that young brother. Um, so when you first heard about that, how did that resonate with you? The Trayvon Martin and the Zimmerman and all that the way that happened at that anybody take that? Yeah, I, I I mean, many parallels have been drawn between Trayvon Martin and Mattel. Yeah. And the thing is, is that 
Um, when Emmett Till got, got killed, got murdered brutally, and folks were getting off, people in the South were like, we can't stay here. They are killing our kids. And there was a migration that happened with Black folks in the South, right, that just bounced. And when Trayvon Martin got killed, it seemed like um, that feeling collectively came back. Our kids ain't safe, right? Being brutally murdered like that, our kids aren't safe. And that's what uh, really, you know, caused this uh, this movement with the help of social media and hashtags and the, and, and the use of technology and whatnot uh, that was at our disposal to do that. Um, and so, you know, with the with the founders of the initiators of Black um, the Black Lives Matter movement, and hats off to them for for starting that. It becomes this big movement, right? Um, I think that, that, like I said before, uh, I want to give my my uh, my the credit to the Black Matters movement, uh, but I also think we have to have critical conversations around. Um, what is the best approach, right? Uh, because when we look at the Black Panther Party, the Black Panther Party differs from the Black Lives Matter movement, where the Black Panther Party was not asking for anything from the government except leave us alone and stop killing us, stop brutalizing us, stop with the police brutality, and we'll handle our own communities, right? When Black Lives Matter was a little bit different, um, Black Lives Matter was asking for things from the government, right? Um, similar to where the civil rights movement was. I feel like the Black Panther part of the Black Lives Matter movement was almost a, a joint thing around, you know, some of the things that the civil rights movement had, some of the things that the Black power movement had. Um, and that's how I kind of look at the Black Lives Matter movement, but certainly uh, necessary for that time. I think that the um, Trayvon Martin thing at his murder, I think that uh, it had to be, this is going to sound crazy. It had to, for me, I had to get past the, a, a level of desensitization once once the, the issue started to open up more and we started to look at it. It's almost like you know, it's almost like because we get bombarded with so many different news cycles and, you know, all of this stuff, it just, it, it, I needed a pause for this young brother. I had to, once I took the pause, the desensitization went away and said, hold up, this is, this is a, this is more than just, you know, a, a news cycle. And I think that um, that started another branch on a tree of our current understanding, you know, the Black Lives Movement, we the summer 2020, all the different things that have come about where, the, where we always put that under the banner of raising consciousness. I think we have a healthy, well, I have a healthy consciousness when it comes to my rights. I remember going into a long two, three year deep dive into understanding my First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, <laughs> you know, because of Trayvon Martin. That started a whole understanding mm -hmm. of when I'm walking the streets. You pull me over, Jack, you know, we go. We gonna do the dance, not the not the dance with the guns, but we are gonna do the legal dance, and, and you know that started that for me. That was the impact of Trayvon Martin of understanding my rights, understanding what it is when I walk these streets that it's not, it's not blasé anymore. It just gotta we gotta be tight, sadly, and you know sadly and necessary. Yeah, and you the, know the question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. Now. Oh, my bad. No, I was just the real the thing that really hit me uh, about Trayvon was the fact that number one, that grown man George Zimmerman pretended like he his life was under threat, um, and that was his argument. So much convincing the police at the time that they let him go that evening. Right, it was twenty five days until that man was charged. Also, on top of that was when Trayvon Martin was first shot. They didn't even look for his family in the housing. Uh, the, uh, place that he was at where he was shot at they marked his body as a John Doe and then drug tested his dead body and see even those facts weren't even put out there like that mm. and for me when I read that when you know I remember taking my babies out I, I think I only had 204 of my boys around at the time 
we were out there protesting. I remember the first Black Lives Matter rallies in Philadelphia was around that time. And it just reminds us of like that continuity of this type of treatment, mistreatment uh, towards black youths. And earlier today, uh, Damon was a part of this conversation, but we were talking about the adultification of black children. Mm -hmm. Like Trayvon mm -hmm. Martin was bodied like he was a grown man. And so much so that this grown ass man was able to make the argument to the police at the time, in real time, after he shot this kid, that he was fearful for his life. And then he ended up getting off of his charges based on that same argument. And the mm -hmm. same argument used about Mike Brown saying, you know, we can go down the list. All of them. What my, what, all what of my, them. with all of these, right? Let me throw that, that up right there. Right there. Um, with all of these notable killings of black folks, right? Question then to black folks is, what is it going to take? Right? What's it going to take? If Trayvon Martin and all of the Ferguson and the, the, the no-knock warrants that kill and all of these things killing Black people, Black youth, Black women, Black men, all of these things happening and being, being caught on film, being shared on social media, and we still haven't done much, what is it going to take? And I feel like the Black Panther Party said, no, no, no. You ain't got to kill all those, that many people. We're going to stand up off of one in Oakland, right? This one was, was too many. Uh, connect to a whole history of killing Black folks? Mm -mm. We're not about to do that no more. Not sitting down, we're not. And I think the question then becomes, what's it going to take? Because it seemed like this racial reckoning for a couple of years happened. A couple companies said they were going to change the uh, way they advertise. A couple places said they're going to change the hiring practices and put some DEI people in place. They did. The government has diminished some of that, and people have forgotten about it and gone back to their old ways. What's it going to take? Hey, brother, listen. Everything you just said is, is like, like literally, like next, 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 next. So, like, right, going back to you know, piece right here. We're getting woke. Rather more conscious. So what's next? What is next? I tell you what's, what's working on right now. And I, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, brother Ishmael, in the other call. You know, we're talking about the Heritage Foundation. We're talking about Project Twenty Twenty Five, and it, it, you know, I'm not. This this is a whole another separate conversation. I'm just dropping this for the people out there. They may have never heard of these Jones, right? And as I'm reading, I'm on the plane, dog, reading this stuff. I'm like, yo, yo, yo. I'm just trying to be relaxing for one thing, but I'm on the plane, like typing stuff on my phone and reading this stuff. And I'm like, yo, storm is coming. I mean, storm is already here, but it's really trying to come. And if you think about what's going on right now, you know, we talked about from Black Power to Black Lives Matter. And all, you know, my, our lives have always mattered, right? You know, but the movement of the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, definitely, you know, through their social media presence and all the things going back to George Floyd. I never thought that I never thought that was going to happen with that officer, whatever his name is, um, was going to actually happen to him. I didn't think that was going to happen. I didn't think it was going to go down like that. You know what I mean? And it could have been, it should have been far worse than that, but I'm surprised he even got what he got, right? But now, as a result of all of that, right, you got folks out here, man, doing these things, man, these foundations and Project 2025, you got, you got the 16, 19 back here in the back or whatnot, they got to play on words, you know, so they got this, we got that, right? And, you know, I'm about, I'm about loving all people if you love me, if you love all people. I'm about loving humanity. Let me put that out there first of all. I love humanity, right? I love Keep people trying to be, you know, righteous for all people. I, I, I truly do, you know. But regardless of what you look like, what color you are, if, if you're not about, you know, the true liberation of our people, I got a problem with you, right? Or the true acceptance of all people, I got a problem with you. I just do, you know. But how can we prepare these babies, prepare these parents, you know? But what's about to come? You know what I mean? And, and, and there are you know, successful models out here. There, there, there have been successful models. Um, uh, one one successful model was the uh, strange bedfellows of the Native American folks with the Jewish folks in regards to uh, understanding that the Department of the Interior had was supposed to be holding in trust all of the treaties and trust with the Native American folks and the, the electric, the minerals, the everything, 
and they found that this was being a whole bunch of IOUs inside of there, and they were owed trillions of dollars. So ultimately, uh, uh, the Jewish community comes and does some level of a partnership with the Native American to show them what they what, 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 what their flex is on Native land that is sovereign. And hence, you see the casinos of the Native American casinos come up that are tax free. It was a hedge against the government. It was a hedge on getting money that they didn't have to pay taxes on. Now you see Native American universities, Native American hospitals. You see the upswing of a, of a play of an alliance. So there's models of alliances, strange fellows as they might be from time to time, where they're mutually beneficial. But there are models out there that show how do you move. If you take that same community across Europe, they kick tail across Europe as they backtrack the data on who did them, who did them dirty in World War II. You know, there's a, there was a lot of reparations being made. There's models out there that we could at least read, glean, take peace, take part, wholesale partner alliance. There's stuff out there for us to look towards what we want to do in the future that is effective at, 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 at making things work for us as a suggestion. Yeah, and I think it all starts at home. So at the end of the day, we're talking about educating the babies outside the home, right? It's, it's got to start at home because... At the end of the day, we don't control like we don't control these systems. We don't own these systems. We work within these systems. We break around these systems. We can have our own mini wins in our homes and in our communities and so on and so forth. But not I would strongly suggest, and people please jump in and have anything else you suggest like Brother Rosario just did. You gotta read up on that Heritage Foundation. You gotta read up on the 2025. You gotta see what's coming, see what's going on, and become aware, right? And how you're gonna navigate. And then the thing that we talk about all the time. It's getting some dual citizenship, like real talk. I'll be honest with you because I I don't know. Get some dual citizenship. I mean, I'm maybe talk to talk to, talk to brother Dr. Brown when it maybe see what's going on power in Canada. I, I don't know. You know what I mean? See what see what's good because it's it's about to get it's about to get but wild up in this joint, man. It's getting it's I, getting but wild up in this joint. I, I I was about to say. I mean, folks remember Reagan, right? Um, this Sean been on some craziness, and and I would even and say the mythology that this society tells itself is collapsing on itself. Yeah. Um, even to the point where these folks are like calling for dictatorship, half of these people. And so like, I'll, I'll even tell my sons, like when you talk about Trump, when you talk about Taylor Swift, like that's America, right? Now, do you know anybody that listens to that music? Do you know anybody that support? Because we're like, unfortunately, sometimes we, we are in those bubbles. But then at the same time, that is the majority, almost the majority of this society right now. Um, and it's a strong representation. So when we look at that, um, I, I, I would say that this should be a wake up call to recognize like what we're doing. We can't double down and think that we're going to plead and beg and get freedom. And I think it was alluded to earlier. We have to demand it. We have to take it. But then also black people in this society have always represented the thing that kept this society from being a truly fascist state. If we just relied on George Washington and them or Thomas Jefferson and them, or even Abraham Lincoln later on without black people taking their own life in their own destiny in their own hands, we wouldn't even have a semblance of an idea or concept related to freedom. And even those fights have inspired other groups within this society to fight for increased rights. Um, so like when we're talking about that, the only thing we should be concerned about is when black folks lose a mind. And the only thing left is this fascist society. Mm. Facts, 100 percent. Anybody else want to speak to that? Yeah, well, the, the, the education piece, I think, is, uh, you know, what do we I, one thing is to, to educate our children. I think that's um, children are represent our future. Right. They represent. Um, the future of our of our people, future of our society, future of, our, of this country, and uh, Frederick Douglass says that it's easier to build strong children mm -hmm. than it is to repair broken men. Mm -hmm. However, unless the teachers of those children are those broken men, mm. and we we have to do both, we have to do both. We have to repair these broken folks and also raise strong children. Um, and, I, I, and it's important not to, to do either or because we'll run into some challenges that make it impossible for us to be successful. Somebody's gotta do the building. 
And if the people doing the building are the broken people, then we're just we're just building broken children, right? Somebody's got to do the building of strong children, and that has to be strong uh, men and women, right? And people in general, right? And so I think that we 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 have to do both. Yeah. Um, and I think that's you know in terms of raising the children and, and education, we have to keep those things in mind. All right, so we're coming to a close, man. It's almost been two hours, man. It's been our longest conversation. But like I said, we lived in this time, and there's so many things that we left on the table and whatnot. But I think there's a lot of content out there that people can take and begin to extend their knowledge base and so on and so forth um, beyond what we talked about tonight, man. Because uh, definitely, it's, it's a blessing, man. So right now, it's announcement time. I'm going to go ahead and share this link real quick. Um, the brother is just shared in, in the box. you know, And I definitely, I already registered. I already registered for this this session right here. Can we all see that out here? Yeah, uh, and I just want to highlight that this is the third year that we're doing this series. It's open to everybody. So if you got a cousin who teaches in Florida or Kentucky or just lives out there and they don't get that type of black history or truth, they're always invited to these virtual sessions. We've had people from Kenya, New Zealand team uh, tune in. But this month, the next one is in uh, March 16th, and we're going to be centering the centrality of Black women in education. So we're going to be looking at like the timeline of the Black uh, Barbie doll, the history of it, which is just fascinating uh, within context of Africana studies, uh, teaching Black history in the K-3 space and beyond. Uh, the Emily Di Davis Diaries, where this free Black woman wrote about her experience during the Civil War, uh, going to a Frederick Douglass speech, seeing Lincoln's procession after he died. Um, these are the type of sessions. And then rounding it out with closing keynote of our sister, uh, Dr. Kamika Royal. Um, it's just going to be a powerful thing. And uh, just to put on people's uh, uh, radars, uh, April 20th will be the one after this. That will be featuring uh, Dr. Michael Gomez. Um, and then May 11th uh, is our last one for the school year, uh, featuring Dr. Goldie Muhammad. And she's going to be speaking about her kind of experience with Africana studies um, and how it's inspired her. So, again, these type of these events are virtual. They're open to everybody in their mama, your cousin in Kentucky, anybody, please invite them. Uh, the more people in these conversations, the better. Thank you, brother, for sharing this. Oh, man, awesome and amazing. No doubt. No doubt. I appreciate you for being on here, man, with me tonight and, and, and every night, man. All the work you're still doing in Philadelphia and looking forward to, uh, you know, what's coming down the pike you know, throughout then in 2025, I'm looking to be a part of that situation up there in Philadelphia with that because I'm, you know, live from the 215, just repping in 302, but I'm always still coming at you. You know what I mean? So uh, all day, all day, every day, man. Brother, brother Rosario, what you got? What you got, bro? Hey, listen, man, we, we are um, doing the main thing. Instruction is our main thing and we keeping the main thing, the main thing over at Harambe. We are uh, pouring into these young people every day. Um, this year, I've, I've taken another position at Lincoln University. I'm doing adjunct. I'm like you, uh, Brother Ish. I'm, okay. I'm teaching the teachers. So I'm, I'm the inst institutional instructor for the student teachers in the graduate school program. And, um, you know, I found that that's another love for me, man. I just have, I teach, I've approached those uh, brothers and sisters like this is a teaching hospital. We're inside of here in our gumbo, making our gumbo and putting our, 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 our seasoning together so that you have these tools to go out as Dr. Brown was saying, sending these new teachers out in, these men and women out into the field to come and teach our babies. And I feel like such a, a positive gatekeeper to get them ready to come out, not just reading a book, not just passing a test, but getting you ready for, as I always say, 10 toes on the ground because we're out here for real. I want to give them some real stuff. So just excited about that, man. I'm glad that Lincoln is having me do that. And hopefully they'll have me back again and again. Hey man, if you need a guest to come on in, let me know, man. Have him, uh, have him watch, uh, you know, the Wire season four. Let's have a conversation after that. Wire season four, because if they're gonna work in the hood, I say all the time that should be on the curriculum. Yeah, peep that. That should be you take that, analyze that, because if they're not about that life, don't waste your time. I mean, it, it uh, is what it is. It's a life, brother. brother, I'm gonna hold you to that. My, next, I'm gonna want you to. I had a, I had one of my um, top ELA teachers come in. And talk to them from an assessment value to show them some resources on how to move and groove. But man, it would be awesome to have uh, an administrator, a teacher growing into administration with your experience to come in and give them some real, because I got a real group, man. 
I'm going to talk to you. Say less, say less, say less, say less. Dr. Uh, Brown, what you got for the people, brother? Yeah, I'm just going to take my time to uh, just honor uh, the folks that are on here, you know, doing great work um, and honor the other people that are just, you know, the other comrades that are doing amazing work um, to try to, you know, contribute in their own way. Um, there are people in all education, of course, we have tons of people um, in, in, in high schools and higher ed, all of that stuff, but also in other industries, too. We got folks in the medical field that are working, folks that are in the marketing advertisement field, folks that are in the legal field, um, folks that are all over doing this work. And I, and I, I certainly want to um, give them honor. Um, want to honor the ancestors, <laughs> of course. I uh, want to mention Carter G. Woodson. It is Black History Month. I don't want to go without mentioning Carter G. Woodson. Um, and so, want to give give uh, give honor to our our Anderson, our our um, our uh, ancestor, and our our fraternity brother Carter G. Woodson. Um, that's it. That's it. I think it was an amazing conversation. I'm just uh, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. Absolutely. Let me just share one last thing uh, and then close this out right here. So I talked a little bit earlier about a few things. I, it's not not on me, but like again, you know, um, you know, resources for the parents. You know, parents, if you're not familiar, have your children at home for this particular segment. Check out Eyes on the Prize. You know, videos and the books. You know, Kids for Cash. It's a you know DVD. You know, you could probably get a. Um, I guess the stream is a point in time. And TWF stands for Teaching with Film. I don't get any money from any of these other organizations, but Teaching with Film, if you take that that resource, right, and then apply it to any film, but especially Kids for Cash, you, it gives you some graphic organizers to break that stuff down, something that I used in the classroom many years ago, the 13th video and also lessons. You can Google that stuff. You can see the 13th video on Netflix, but then also you can Google lessons. You can Google lesson materials to go along with that as well. And new Jim Crow, you know, book in the workbook. But be your own resource. Research, 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 right? You are a resource yourselves, parents, you know, out there in the world. Um, some of the stuff that I've got going on right now, still as always, just, you know, got my merch on, you know, EQ of IQ equals a better you, because at the end of the day, a lot of this and how we deal with a lot of these things, these, you know, these institutions and the racism that we face, you know, is how we process through our emotions. You know, we have a lot of trauma and then the trauma impacts our emotions and whatnot. So do workshops on that. You just scan the QR code and we can hook up like that as well. I do have something coming up really soon. This got pegged to do some, um, some anti-gang you know, podcasts and whatnot, you know, coming up soon because I got a lot of experience, you know, with gangs in the Philadelphia area and, you know, being a former principal of a, G of a JJC. So um, stay tuned for that coming out sometime in March. Got some filming coming up soon, man. So, and trying to make sure that is also African centered as well because we're talking about the kids, you know, we need rights to passage, right? We need rights to passage, right? You know, not just that gang thing. Let's take it to do it a different kind of way. Sort of like what hip hop did, right? It'd be going back to 50 years of hip hop. Hip hop, you know, with the black spades and the different gangs and whatnot. And then, you know, hip hop came in there and it became more about, you know, break dance and then graffiti arts and, and then the music and so on and so forth. And brother Ish, I'm definitely gonna hit you up for that about that conference. I think it's going on this summer up in Buffalo, right? And then when they talked about, yeah, I'm very I didn't couldn't go last year, but I think I might try to get up there this year and we can have a conversation offline about that. Cause I think that joint was awesome and amazing. I think brother Mark. Uh, brother Mark Anderson, if you know him, he was an educator in Philadelphia doing math coaching right now. I think him and his wife went up there and they said it was awesome. So, oh, you know, I met them. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Dr. LeGarrett King. Yes, uh, yes. He said to the University of Buffalo, uh, teaching black history conference in Buffalo. Black to the future is the theme. Uh, it's going to be going July 24th through the 26th. Um, okay. So, Buffalo ain't too bad at the end of July, y'all. So, think about it. And we'll be close to, uh, Canada, Dr. Brown, if you want to make your way over, bro. Definitely. Hey, listen, man, I appreciate y'all. Hold on for one second. And people out there have been hanging in there for the entire time. I see good folks on there. Appreciate y'all on, on, on Zoom. Anybody out there on YouTube, you know, out there on, on Facebook, wherever you are, man, appreciate you um, for hanging out with us these past four weeks. And this will be taped, obviously, and it'll be shared you know, out the world and they live in uh, perpetuity, hopefully, you know. So but we'll, we'll see how, how that goes. Uh, but uh, thank, to, thank you to everybody out there. You know, God bless you all and good night. Peace. Yeah. All right, brother, I appreciate the uh, conversation. I probably should get off before I get in trouble with the wife, though. Yeah, but, man. Same thing, man. Same uh, thing. Dr. Brown, I, I, 
I'm going to be looking you up, brother. Don't be surprised if you receive a random email from me. <laughs> I appreciate it. University of Florida. That's where I'm at, African American Studies. All right, all right. And Florida, I think, was one of the first states to mandate Black history to be taught, ain't it? 